Hi, welcome to Watch It Played. My name is Rodney Smith, and in this video, we're going to learn the one to four player game, Explorers of the North Sea, designed by Shem Phillips and published by Garf Hill Games. In the later years of the Viking Age, ship captains set sail to explore new lands. You'll transport your crew to capture livestock and settle new outposts, all in an effort to become the most prestigious leader. So join me at the table, and let's learn how to play. To set up, choose one of these double-sided starting boards with either side face up, though this one is recommended for first-time players. Now shuffle these 48 tiles into a face-down stack nearby, or if you're worried, like I often am, that someone's going to have wild hands and knock the stack over, you can make them a little shorter by dividing them in half. Then deal three face down to each player. In this video, we're going to set up for a two-player game. You'll keep your own tile secret from the other players, but you can always look at your own. Shuffle these captain's sheets, dealing two face down to each player. They'll look at them privately, choosing one to keep and the other to return to the box, along with any undealt ones. Once everyone is chosen, they'll flip their captains face up. Each player now collects one longship, seven vikings, and five outposts in their chosen color. Anywhere on the shoreline of this large space, known as the mainland, each player will put their longship with two Vikings in it. All remaining player Vikings are then put on the mainland. Nearby, create a pool of these livestock, settlement, and enemy ship pieces. The settlements and ships should have these sides face up, and both of these piles should be shuffled thoroughly before playing. Finally, you'll randomly choose a starting player and then give the player to their right this winter token. And that's the setup. But just so you know, for the purposes of this video, I'm going to move a lot of these components off screen and then just bring them back in as necessary. In Explorers of the North Sea, players will sail their ships to discover new lands, create settlements, attack enemy ships, and gather livestock, all for the purposes of having the most points by the end of the game. The game is played starting with the first player, completely taking their turn, then the next player goes, and around and around like this until the end of the game. At the start of your turn, you must always choose and play one tile from your hand, attaching it either to one of these three spaces of the starting board, or as time goes on, to another tile that's already in play. However, all touching edges must always match. So for example, if over time the tiles were added like this, then I couldn't put this tile here because the edges don't match up. I'd either have to put it somewhere else, use a different tile, or potentially rotate the tile so that it does fit. Another restriction is that no tile may ever come in contact with the artwork of this main land. But you can still place tiles beneath this area. The only restriction, again, is that a tile cannot come in contact with it, so this would not be allowed. In the very rare case that you can't legally play any of the tiles in your hand, reveal them, shuffle them into the supply, and draw back an equal amount, and then continue your turn. Once a new tile is played, you'll then add a single piece to it based on the illustration found there. Sometimes it will show one of the six different types of livestock, and it shouldn't be hard to figure out which images represent which pieces, but you can follow this chart as found in the rulebook if you have any questions. For example, when adding this tile, we see pigs pictured. So we'd add a single pig there. Not all livestock is equally easy to come by in the game. This illustration from the rulebook also shows that distribution. Instead of animals, the tile might show one of these settlements, in which case the player takes a random settlement token from the supply and places it face up here. These values can range from 2 to 5. If the new tile shows an enemy ship, then take one of these tokens from the supply and cover it up. However, make sure that this token stays face down so you don't see the illustration on the other side. We'll go over what each of these different pieces do a little bit later. But once a player has added a new tile to the board and added a single piece to it, they'll then get to take up to four actions from six possible options. And these can be repeated, and taken in any order. So let's go back to the table and learn what these six options are. If your longship has at least one Viking in it, then as an action, you can move from a tile to a connected sea space of an adjacent tile as long as there was water for you to sail through. 
you can't cross land. In other words, if I used another action to then move here, I couldn't use another action to hop over this landmass and end up in this sea space. But I'm sure that was pretty obvious. There's also no limit to how many longships can be in the same space. So for example, I could move here for an action and nothing happens. It's important to note that Viking ships will not fight one another. You're technically all from the same clan, just different leaders within it. However, if you want to spend an action to move into a space with one of these enemy ship tokens, your longship must have at least two Vikings in it. So if the yellow player only had one Viking in their ship, on their turn they couldn't spend an action to move into this sea space. But let's say that they did have two Vikings in the ship. When you encounter an enemy boat, that token is destroyed. You'll flip it over, and if it shows this symbol, then place it on your captain's sheet. If it instead had shown these two symbols, you'll still place it on your sheet, but this means that one of your Vikings died in the battle. So you'll place one of them from your boat onto this sheet as well, where it will stay for the rest of the game. Vikings who die in sea battles and the ship tokens you collect will earn you points later in the game. Another option is to load your longship. With a single action, you can load any number of Vikings and or livestock onto your ship from one piece of land that is on the same tile as the longship itself. For example, I could load this Viking and this chicken onto my ship, but not this horse. Even though it's on the same connected piece of land, it's on a different tile. It should also be noted that livestock can't load itself onto the ship. Either a Viking would already have to be on land, pushing the livestock onto the ship while staying behind, or the Viking can choose to enter the ship with the livestock. Keep in mind, a boat may carry, at most, any combination of up to three Vikings and or livestock. But never more than two livestock, as you would need at least one Viking in order to sail the vessel. Another option is to unload a longship. With a single action, the player may move any number of Vikings and or livestock from their ship to a piece of land on the same tile. Again, livestock can't unload itself. In this situation, we'd first have to spend an action to have a Viking enter the ship. Then we could spend an action to unload the ship, where the Viking could either choose to push the livestock off or leave at the same time as well. If livestock is ever unloaded onto the mainland, it is immediately moved to the unloading player's captain's sheet. This will give them points at the end of the game, as we'll see. I should also point out that over the course of the game, it's very possible to have Vikings spread across different lands and left behind. That's perfectly fine. You can even have an empty ship. Just remember to start sailing it again. You're going to have to load one of your Vikings back onto it. Another action is to move your Vikings. In that single action, you may move one or two of your Vikings from one land space to a connected land space on an adjacent tile. However, your Vikings may not walk across water to get to land. Those awkward, heavy, albeit fashionable helmets they're always wearing would cause them to sink. Also note, there's no limit to the number of livestock or Vikings of any color that can share the same land space. When taking this action, you may enter a land space with a settlement at any time. But as soon as a single player has a number of their Vikings on that tile equal to or greater than this token value, that settlement is immediately rated at no extra cost. I should also point out that Vikings on ships in nearby waters do not count towards this total. Rated settlement tokens are placed face down on the rating player's captain sheet to be scored later, and a rated settlement can't be rated again. Another action is to transport livestock, which allows you to move one livestock with one of your Vikings from a land space to a connected land space on an adjacent tile. Livestock must be accompanied by at least one Viking when traveling in this way. But just because you moved an animal doesn't mean it's yours. For example, on the green player's turn as an action, they could then choose to transport this livestock somewhere else, or even more likely, they might choose to use the load action to pick up these two animals and jump into the ship. That said, once animals are on a boat, they can no longer be taken by another player, even if their ships are sharing spaces. The final option actually requires a player to spend two of their actions at once, and it's called constructing an outpost. You may do this on any point 
where there are three tiles connected by land where you have at least two of your Vikings on any of those three tiles, even if they're both on the same tile. So for example, the yellow player could construct an outpost here, here, or here. To complete the action, they then place one of their outposts from their personal supply onto the point that they've chosen. An important restriction is that a single tile can only have one outpost connected to it. So with an outpost here, no player of any color can build an outpost on either of these four points because they all use at least one of these tiles that this outpost is already on. You couldn't even build an outpost on this point, even though this is a separate island, because one of its tiles is also the tile that is part of this outpost. Now that said, the same, or a different player, could put an outpost here. Even though it's connected to the same land as this one, none of its three tiles are part of these three tiles. Once placed, outposts may not be moved or destroyed, but they can give you points later, as we'll see. So to recap, on your turn, you'll first play a tile from your hand to the growing landscape in front of you, and then add the appropriately pictured piece to that tile. You then perform up to four actions, but you can choose to do fewer if you want. To signify the end of your turn, you then add a new tile to your hand. If there's no tiles left, then you don't. Players will continue taking turns like this until the player holding the winter token has no more tiles in hand. They'll complete that turn that used their last tile, and then the game will end. Now this should be exactly 48 turns because there are 48 tiles, but the rules do state that sometimes players forget to play a tile on their turn. If that happens, it says, don't worry about it, just continue playing. It simply means that at the end of the game, it is possible that some players may have one or more tiles left in hand. At the end of the game, it's now time to score, so let's go to the table and see how that works. The game comes with a score pad to help you with this step, and the first thing you'll score is your livestock. These are the animals on your character sheet, and remember, they got here because these are the animals that you delivered back to the mainland. Take all of the livestock on your sheet and organize them into groups that are as large as possible that contain, at most, one of each type of animal. So here we've got three separate column groups, each having no more than one of each type of animal. Now using the chart on your captain sheet, which will be the same for everyone, you'll find the points to score based on how big each group is. So these groups would score me 10, 3, and 1 point for a total of 14. You'll also gain points based on the number of outposts that you built onto the board. In this case, if I had built three outposts, I'd gain 9 points. Then, as shown here, you gain one point for each enemy ship token that you destroyed. So in this case, two points. Now flip over any settlement tokens that you might have and score points equal to the values printed on them. So here, I would gain nine points. Then gain points equal to the number of your Vikings that died in sea battles multiplied by that same number. So if two had died, that would be two times two, which is four points. Now obviously this is not the way the board would look like at the end of the game because there'd be a lot more tiles out, but let's just pretend this is the end of the game for the sake of this example. Players now score points based on the completed islands that they control. A completed island is one that is totally explored and completely surrounded by water. So this is a scorable island, but this isn't, and neither is this. Even though it's completely surrounded by water, there's a piece missing, so it isn't fully explored. You'll now go one by one and score each of these completed islands. First, count the influence that each player has on an island. A viking there provides them with one influence point, and an outpost provides them with two. So the yellow player has three influence here, and the green player only has two influence. Vikings in ships never count towards the total influence on an island. The player with the most influence now gains one point per tile that makes up the island. So here, yellow would score one, two, three, four, five, six points. If there had been a tie for most influence, the tied players would each score the island in full. Finally, score points based on your captain sheet, which will have a unique scoring bonus listed on it. The scout, for example, gains one extra point for each complete island that player does not control, but has at least one or more Vikings present on it. So on this island here, where yellow currently has control, Green has some of its Vikings on it and would score a bonus point. 
Each captain's ability is explained on their sheets, but if you have any questions, you'll find detailed examples in the rulebook. Players now total their scores, and the one with the most points wins. In the case of a tie, the tied player who lost the most Vikings in glorious sea battles wins. If there's still a tie, the tied player who raided the most settlements is the winner. But keep in mind, it's the number of settlements that counts, not the total value of them. If there's still a tie, then the tied players share the victory. And that's everything you need to know to play Explorers of the North Sea. Now, there are also included rules for solo play, but I'll leave that for you to discover on your own. If you have any questions, though, about anything you saw here, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below, and I'll gladly answer them as soon as I get a chance. But until the next episode, thanks for watching.